Caliban and the Witch section, the European witches and the, quote, Indios. Did the witch hunts in the New World have an impact on events in Europe? Or were the two persecutions simply drawing from the same pool of repressive strategies and tactics which the European ruling class had forged since the Middle Ages with the persecution of the heretics? I ask these questions having in mind the thesis advanced by the Italian historian Luciano Parinetto, who argues that witch hunting in the New World had a major impact on the elaboration of the witchcraft ideology in Europe, as well as the chronology of the European witch hunt. Briefly put, Parinetto's thesis is that it was under the impact of the American experience that the witch hunt in Europe became a mass phenomenon in the second part of the 16th century. For in America, the authorities and the clergy found the confirmation for their views about devil worship, coming to believe in the existence of entire populations of witches, a conviction which they then applied in their Christianization drive at home. Thus, another import from the New World, described by missionaries as, quote, the land of the devil, was the adoption by the European state of extermination as a political strategy, which presumably inspired the massacre of the Huguenots and the massification of the witch hunt starting in the last decades of the 16th century. Footnote. I am referring in particular to the trials that were conducted by the Inquisition in the Dauphine in the 1440s, during which a number of poor people, peasants or shepherds, were accused of cooking children to make magic powders with their bodies, and to the work of the Swabian Dominican Joseph Nader, Formicarius, 1435, in which we read that witches, quote, cook their children, boil them, eat their flesh, and drink the soup that is left in the pot. From the solid matter they make a magical salve or ointment, the procurement of which is the third reason for child murder, end quote. Russell points out that this, quote, salve or ointment is one of the most important elements of witchcraft in the 15th century and later. End of footnote. Evidence of a crucial connection between the two persecutions is, in Parinetto's view, the use made by the demonologists in Europe of the reports from the Indies. Parinetto focuses on Jean Baudin, but he also mentions Francesco Maria Guazzo and cites as an example of the, quote, boomerang effect produced by the transplanting of the witch hunt in America, the case of the inquisitor Pierre Lancre, who, during a several months' persecution in the region of the Labourde, Basque country, denounced its entire population as witches. Not last, Parnetto cites, as evidence of his thesis, a set of themes that, in the second half of the 16th century, became prominent in the repertoire of witchcraft in Europe cannibalism, the offering of children to the devil, the reference to ointments and drugs, and the identification of homosexuality, sodomy, with diabolism, all of which, he argues, had their matrix in the New World. What to make of this theory, and where to draw the line between what is accountable and what is speculative? This is a question that future scholarship will have to settle. Here, I limit myself to a few observations. Parinetto's thesis is important, since it helps us dispel the Eurocentrism that has characterized the study of the witch hunt, and can potentially answer some of the questions raised by the persecution of the European witches. But its main contribution is that it broadens our awareness of the global character of capitalist development, and makes us realize that, by the 16th century, a ruling class had formed in Europe that was, at all points, involved, practically, politically, and ideologically, in the formation of a world proletariat, and therefore was continually operating with knowledge gathered on an international level in the elaboration of its models of domination. As for its claims, we can observe that the history of Europe before the conquest is sufficient proof that the Europeans did not have to cross the oceans to find the will to exterminate those standing in their way. It is also possible to account for the chronology of the witch hunt in Europe without resorting to the New World Impact Hypothesis, since the decades between the 1560s and 1620s saw a widespread impoverishment and social dislocations throughout most of Western Europe. Picture Francesco Maria Guazzo, Compendium Maleficarum, Milan, 1608 
Quazzo was one of the demonologists most influenced by the reports from the Americas. The portrait of witches surrounding the remains of bodies excavated from the ground or taken from the gallows is reminiscent of the cannibal banquet. End of caption. Another picture. Cannibals preparing their meal. Hans Staden's Warfaftige Historia, Marburg, 1557. End of caption. Another picture. Preparation for the Sabbat. German engraving from the 16th century. End of caption. Another picture. Preparing a cannibal meal. Hans Staden's Warhaftige Historia, 1557. End caption. More suggestive in provoking a rethinking of the European witch hunt from the viewpoint of witch hunting in America are the thematic and the iconographic correspondences between the two. The theme of self-ointing is one of the most revealing, as the descriptions of the behavior of the Aztec or Incan priests on the occasion of human sacrifices evoke those found in some of the demonologies describing the preparations of the witches for the Sabbat. Consider the following passage found in Acosta, which reads the American practice as a perversion of the Christian habit of consecrating priests by anointing them. Beginning of long quote. The idle priests in Mexico oint themselves in the following way. They grease themselves from the feet to the head, including the hair. The substance with which they stain themselves was ordinary tea, because from antiquity it was always an offering to their gods, and for this much worshipped. This was their ordinary greasing, except when they went to sacrifice, or went to the caves where they kept their idols, when they used a different greasing to give themselves courage. This grease was made of poisonous substances, frogs, salamanders, vipers. With this greasing they could turn into magicians, brujos, and speak with the devil. End of quote. The same poisonous brew was presumably spread by the European witches on their bodies, according to their accusers, in order to gain the power to fly to the Sabbat. But it cannot be assumed that this theme was generated in the New World, as references to women making ointments from the blood of toads or children's bones are already found in the 15th century trials and demonologies. Footnote. I am referring in particular to the trials that were conducted by the Inquisition in the Dauphine in the 1440s, during which a number of poor people, peasants or shepherds, were accused of cooking children to make magic powders with their bodies, and to the work of the Swabian Dominican Joseph Nader, for Macarius, 1435, in which we read that witches, quote, cook their children, boil them, eat their flesh, and drink the soup that is left in the pot. From the solid matter, they make a magical salve or ointment, the procurement of which is the third reason for child murder. End quote. Russell points out that, quote, this salver ointment is one of the most important elements of witchcraft in the 15th century and later. End of footnote. What is plausible, instead, is that the reports from America did revitalize these charges, adding new details and giving more authority to them. The same consideration may serve to explain the iconographic correspondence between the pictures of the Sabbat and the various representations of the cannibal family and clan that began to appear in Europe in the later 16th century. And it can account for many other, quote, coincidences, such as the fact that both in Europe and America, witches were accused of sacrificing children to the devil. End of section.